Appreciate that. Great big howdy, everybody here in Sweden. Uh, I uh, This is my second trip to Sweden. I have not been here since the year 2000. I uh, was over here in 2000, and I toured 35 cities, and I uh, spoke in schools, universities, churches all over the place, and uh, it, was, it was a hard tour, and I didn't know if I'd ever come back, and then uh, I got invited back, and I'm very pleased to be here today, and I met some of you, and I hope uh, what's shared today, people can really get something out of it to help change the world. Um, I am a fighter against racism and hatred, and I work with the FBI. I work with the United States uh, Justice Department and also the United States Armed Forces as a, as a diversity agent of change. The, I, I was very pleased a few years ago, the Army gave me an award saying I was an official agent of change because I proved that people can change. Okay, you don't have to stay in the same position that you are in. And the way that I changed, uh, for those of you who may not know who I am, I am someone who overcame a lot of obstacles in life, but I did a 100% turn in my life. And people find that fascinating, okay? But um, I was once a racist, and I absolutely hated people that had a different color of skin. But 23 years ago, I had a change in my life. And I decided, once I changed, that I would work to try to get other people to change. And I didn't want to live in a world full of hate. Now, first of all, you have to understand hate. If, if you take a stand against racism, you have to understand where it comes from, or you'll never be able to combat it right. Hatred is a learned response. You are not born with hate. Someone has to teach you hatred. And when I was a little kid, I was growing up in the Deep South, and I lived in a segregated area, and uh, my neighborhood was all white. There was nothing but white folks around. Matter of fact, I was five years old before I found out there was people of other colors of skin. And I saw a black man, and he was carrying his groceries. And I said to my father, I said, hey, Daddy, look, there's a chocolate-covered man. I go, that guy's made out of chocolate. And I'm jumping up and down on the car seat going, chocolate man, chocolate man, chocolate man. And my dad, he took a puff on his cigar, and he goes, boy, that's not a chocolate-covered man. And he used a racial slur to describe that man. And so from that point on, when I, whenever I saw black people, I had a fear of black people inside my heart. And as I grew up, people were telling me more and more things to cause me to fear people of other races. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King once asked, why do people hate one another? Dr. King said, men hate one another because they fear one another. They fear one another because they do not know one another. And they do not know one another because they are separated or segregated. You see, if we separate ourselves from people we don't know, we have a fear of what we don't know, and fear always turns into hate because people hate what they fear. I've never met anybody in my life that says, ooh, I just love fearing things. That doesn't happen. People hate fear. So as a little boy, I was taught all of this fear, and I didn't want to be around people of other races because it was being taught to me. Now, my father, he committed suicide when I was 11 years old, and my mother didn't want her kids, and she got rid of me and sent me to California. I came from a middle-class home, and I was a kid who had anything he wanted. But my mother was an alcoholic, and after my dad died, she sent me away to live in California with my sister who was on drugs. And I went out to live in California in a gang-ridden territory, and I was being bullied and chased by gangs all the time. And so I had fear in my heart. I, was, I couldn't understand why my father had killed himself. I couldn't understand why I was out there. And I was thinking about committing suicide at 14 years old because I had no friends and I didn't want to go on in life when I met a man from the Ku Klux Klan. And this guy comes to me and, and we're talking and he tells me, he said, son, your problem is, is that you don't have a family. He said, you need a family. And he says, if you come join the Ku Klux Klan, we'll be your family. We'll protect you. No one's going to mess with you. You don't have to worry about being bullied anymore. And when I heard that, I made the wrong choice in life at 14 years old to get involved with the KKK. And so they started coming and getting me and taking me to meetings. They taught me how to fight. They taught me how to look after myself. And, and then I started getting more and more books and literature, and I began to read. And I ended up hating people who never done anything to me. I didn't even know. I had never met a Jew in my life, but they had me hating the Jews 
because of the literature that they would give me, and I began to feed that stuff into my mind. You talk about a cult, the Ku Klux Klan is probably the biggest cult that I've ever seen in my life because that's how they feed on people, and they began to teach people that. So I began to work my way up. I started going up the ladder, and when I finished school, I, well, I actually I went back to Oklahoma, and I finished school in Oklahoma. And then I began to attend Klan rallies throughout the South, and they recruited me to be a bodyguard for the Imperial Wizard at the time. And then afterwards, I started recruiting more people. I was doing interviews on television. I was going to marches and demonstrations, and I became a true believer. Now, I had prejudice in my heart. The word prejudice means to prejudge. I judged a whole group of people by the actions of a few. I already had judgments already in my mind before I even met them. And one day, I got a phone call to appear on a radio show. And this radio show was uh, heard all across the nation. And I had been on the front pages of the newspapers and been uh, on TV all the time, and people knew who I was. And so this radio station had the idea of setting a Klan leader down with a black civil rights leader and having them go at it. And so I, I had never had this happen before, and I agreed to go be on the show. And the guy they had me lined up to debate was a guy named Reverend Wade Watts, who was a black minister, pastored a black Baptist church, and he was a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King's. He had marched with Dr. King, and he had worked for civil rights. And he once said that if you want to play beautiful music, you got to learn to mix those black and white keys together on the piano. And so this man, when he heard to, uh, he was chat to being invited to come debate me, he shows up to debate me, and I'm thinking in my mind, what would Reverend Wade Watts look like? And I figured he was going to come in with a great big afro this big. I figured he'd have an, on an African dashiki with bones hanging around his neck and a great big button that says, I hate white people. I figured he'd be carrying a boom box on his shoulder, blaring out the theme from Superfly or Shout. And I figured he would come in and he'd pull a switchblade on me and go, Black is beautiful, white boy. I hate you whiteies. I'm going to cut me a cracker tonight. You know, now that's what I thought I was going to see. And I was ready to give him a good old-fashioned Oklahoma slobber knocker if he started any problems with me, you know. And so I walk in there, you know, and I'm ready for a fight. But instead, in walks this nicely dressed black man, and he's carrying a Bible in his hand. He walks up, and he puts his hand out to me. And he goes, hello, Mr. Clary. I'm Reverend Wade Watts, and I came here tonight to tell you I love you, and Jesus loves you. And he's shaking my hand, and I jerk my hand back. And I started looking at my hand, because the Klan rule book says never touch a black person. The physical touch of a black person is pollution, and I'm looking at my hand. And I go, my gosh, I just touched a black person. Instead of him getting mad, he smiled. He goes, don't worry, Johnny, it won't come off. And I started calling him names. I go, you no good, sorry, black so-and-so. You and he looks at me and he goes, God bless you. I said, I hate you. And he goes, Jesus loves you. And he goes, and I do too. And finally, you know, when the debate was over, I get ready to leave. And he says, Johnny, you can't do enough to me to make me hate you. He goes, I'm going to love you and I'm going to pray for you whether you like it or not. And I said, well, we'll see about that. And so the KKK, they started harassing him. They burned a cross across the street from his house. And he came outside instead of living in fear. He didn't let fear get the best of him. He walks out there with the cross burning and the Klan standing right out in front of his house, and he says, did you boys bring enough hamburgers and hot dogs for your barbecue? He goes, if you're thirsty, I got some iced tea. It must be awful hot around that fire. Y'all thirsty, I'll give you a glass. And they all got mad and left. And one night, they was marching around his house with white sheets on trying to scare him. And he comes outside. And he goes, boys, you guys are early. Halloween's four more months away. If you want candy, you come back in October, and I'll give you some candy. Good night, KKK. And he went back in, and he shut the door. And the clan got mad and left again. And so finally, they got so mad, they set fire to his church, and they tried to burn his church down. But they put the fire out like nothing happened. And, I, and one night, I called him up on the phone. And I said, I'll show you. I'll scare the daylights out of this guy. So when he answered the phone, I disguised my voice. And I said, hey, boy, we're coming to see you, and you better be afraid. You don't know who this is, but we'll see you real soon. And he goes, hello, Johnny. He goes, a man like you takes the time to call me. I am so honored. And he goes, let me do something for you. He goes, Lord Jesus, Johnny wants attention. He probably didn't get a lot of attention when he was a kid, so I want to pray for him, and I slammed the phone down. I said, how dare him pray for me? Who does he think he is, you know? 
And, uh, and so one day we found him in this restaurant. And this story became a legend all across the world. Uh, but we found him in this restaurant, and he was, uh, back in them days, it, wa it was illegal to tell black people that they couldn't be served in a, in a public place. But the way racists would do, whenever a black person went into a restaurant, if they didn't want him there, they walked up and said, whatever you do to that food, we'll do to you. And black people didn't want trouble, so they would just pay their bill and leave. But not Reverend Watts. He comes in and sits down and ordered his food, and I walked up with a bunch of my buddies, and I said, we don't want you in here. I said, so I'm going to make you a promise. Whatever you do to that food on your plate, I'm going to do the same thing to you. And he had some chicken on the plate, so he picked up the chicken and he kissed it. <laughs> now, now, when he did that, I looked up and everybody in the restaurant was laughing, including the KKK, you know. They said, sorry, boss, but that was funny. He got you there. I said, everyone, if you get outside right now, I'm going to take your sheets away from you, you know, and all that stuff. I was really upset and everything. But and then I heard a horn honk, and Reverend Watts is driving off waving. He goes, bye, KKK, bye, Johnny. And I never bothered him again. See, he knew that hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers all wrongs. See, you, the key to it was is not to get down on the same level as the Ku Klux Klan. See, this man was a public figure, and he got calls from the Black Panthers, and they said, if you got problems with the KKK, let us know, and we'll come down there, and we'll kill every white person we see. He goes, oh, no, thank you. I don't want that kind of help. He goes, I got God on my side, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the love of God to win these people over. And that's exactly what people were. The Klan decided to leave this man alone, and I didn't bother him anymore, and, and my life continued on for several years in the Klan. But I didn't like what I was becoming. I was young and I was in my 20s. And I was working my way up the ranks. And finally, they put me on Oprah Winfrey. And they made me a spokesperson nationally. And now they voted me in to be their national spokesperson. And they expected a lot out of me. But when you become national spokesperson, you also become a target. Now, what was happening, neo-Nazis and skinheads were coming along. And I did not like neo-Nazis and skinheads. I did not believe in worshiping Hitler, and that's what these people do is they worship Hitler. And so this, these people were coming along, and I was having conflicts with them. Now I had the FBI was looking at me and garnering my attention. I guarded their attention because I was involved with these people. And they were trying to figure out. They said I was pretty good at recruiting people. When I did Oprah Winfrey, I had all kinds of people joining the KKK. But then I met this girl, and I fell head over heels in love with her. And she became my girlfriend, and I took her on the road with me. I told her every secret that there was about the Klan. I told her who was back in the Ku Klux Klan with money. I told her where the stockpiles of arms and ammunition was being hidden. I told her where the training camps was at. When I got done, there wasn't anything she didn't know. Come to find out, she was an undercover agent for the FBI. <laughs> so depression set in. <laughs> okay. I find out that she's an undercover informant. And next thing you know, she flees into the Federal Witness Protection Program, turns everything over to the FBI, and the FBI is busting people all over the country and watching people. And now all of a sudden, the Klan starts turning against me and blaming me. And they said, you couldn't even tell that your own girlfriend was a federal informant. And the skinheads of the Nazis was encouraging the Klan to take me out and kill me and all this kind of stuff. And so next thing I thought, I thought, so this is the family that said they would always be my family. And all of a sudden, I kept thinking about the day I was recruited when I was 14 years old, and they said, we'll be your family for life. I go, so they'll be your family until you make a mistake, and then they all turn on you. And that's how cults operate. And so all of a sudden, there I was, and I was absolutely tore up, and my life was in turmoil. And I ended up going, getting away. I resigned. I turned away from these people. And now I had not only all the traditional enemies of the Klan, hating me, but now I had the Klan and the Nazis and the skinheads hating me. I didn't have a friend at all. And, and my life sunk deeper and deeper into depression. I couldn't get a job anywhere. I was going broke. And finally one night, I was faced with making a tough choice. I thought about how my dad left this world, and I thought maybe I should have committed suicide when I was 14. And I went so far as to writing a suicide note. I had an eviction notice on my house. I was playing hide the car from the repo man. I figured my life was over, I had no friends, and I decided to end it all. And as I wrote that suicide note, I looked over and there was a Bible. And I looked at the Bible and I thought, it's too late now for no Bible, I've screwed my life up. 
But instead, and I had been watching this preacher on TV named Jimmy Swagger. And I had been watching him, and he was the well-known preacher that was having crusades all over the world with thousands of people giving their heart to Christ. And I had been taping him, and I got to thinking, I looked at that Bible, and I opened the Bible, and I started reading it, and then I got out those tapes, and I started watching those tapes. And finally, instead of pulling the trigger and ending my life, I got on my knees, and I said, God, if you're really a God of forgiveness, I need help, and I need forgiveness for what I've done. I'll change God. I'll straighten up. I'll go to church. I'll do whatever it takes, but I can't go on like this. And I prayed that prayer, and I started going to church. I, got, I had no of those, none of those old friends hanging around anymore. I went, and I needed to get rid of my old life, so I went and I got all that old clan stuff that I had, literature, books, clan robes, clan paraphernalia. I built a bonfire, and I burned every bit of it. I decided that it was time to change my life. And when that happened, my life completely changed. I started... I got a good job that was offered to me. I started making money. I had a nice home. I bought a Cadillac. I had a swimming pool. One year later, I was sitting around outside my swimming pool thinking I've come such a long ways in a year and how comfortable I was with my life. But then I went in and I turned on the television set and I saw young teenagers joining these hate groups. And I watched them and I began to shake my head and I go, these kids are screwing up their lives and they're the same age I was when I got involved with these groups. And I thought, somebody needs to go tell those kids not to mess up their lives. And so I began to pray. I said, God, find somebody to go talk to those kids. So that they don't, and God said, I am. <laughs> you know, and stuff. And I started thinking, I thought, what about me? What about me? Because you see, our life isn't just about us. It's about people from all walks of life. And so I made that choice. I said, all right. I'm going to do what I can to help. And I didn't know how to get started, and I began to pray. And all of a sudden, Reverend Wade Watts popped into mind. And I hadn't thought of him in a long time. And I picked up the telephone, and I called him up. And uh, he answered the phone, and he remembered me. And I told him what had happened with my life. And he said, well, why don't you come down here and share your story at my all-black church? He said, you do remember my church, don't you, John? I said, uh-oh. It's finally, I said, all right. I said, how do I get there? And he goes, you ought to know. You people burned it down. And he got up in front of his church, and he says, church, I got a surprise for you. Next week, we're going to have the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan come preach for you. And they go, oh, no. Don't bring that man here. He's a terrible man. He set fire to this place. He goes, that's the same thing they said about Saul of Tarsus when he became Apostle Paul. He goes, I'm going to have him. So anyway, I show up that day, and half the congregation stayed away. The other half was taken up by the news media. They were all there out in full force. I walked in there, and these black people came down and just sat down, and they folded up their arms to give me this look. And I got up in front of the church, and I said, Hi, I've changed. I love you now. And instead of amen, I heard, mm-hmm. <laughs> Finally, I said, man, there is no way, there is no way that uh, they're going to believe me. But, you know, I almost wanted to leave, but I still stayed there, and I talked about how my life had changed, and all of a sudden, things happened. I heard those mm hmms turn to, yes, sir, that's right, amen, and I gave the altar call, and Reverend Wade Watts had 13 children. Four of them was, they did not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and four of them that didn't know came forward and gave their lives to the Lord, and then Reverend Wade Watts and I became best of friends. We started getting uh, invitations to speak across America, and then talk shows started calling. And I found myself on Phil Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael, Jerry Springer. God forgive me for that one. Okay, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I wouldn't want to go on his show <laughs> anymore. But uh, all these other shows that I was going on, and, and uh, ABC, CBS, Fox News, all of them calling me up and, and doing all these interviews. And, and I began to get invitations to go around the world and to help change people. And people started seeing that there was a hope. You see, I'm a Christian, but I like to think that in this world, we can respect other people's beliefs. See, a real Christian will not hate someone because they have a different religion. A real Christian will not sit there and judge someone because they happen to be a Muslim, or they happen to be a Buddhist, or happen to be an atheist. A real Christian will respect that other person. We have, we, I don't agree with other religions and things like that, but I respect their right to believe the way they want to. And that is where you got true diversity, is when you can respect each other's rights and you can come together and say, we may not agree on everything, but let's find the things we do agree upon. 
and let's respect each other's rights to disagree. And so things began to happen. And Reverend Wade Watts and I, as we traveled around for seven years, I, was, I benefited from that man. And he taught me what it was like to walk in the other fellow's shoes. And I said, Reverend Watts, why didn't you hate me when I did all those terrible things to you? He says, Johnny, your father taught you to hate. My father taught me to love. There's a difference. He goes, when I was a little boy, I made friends with a, a, uh, a little white boy that lived down the road. And he invited me to his home to play. And I went down there to play. And his mama come out and said, y'all come on in. I've got lunch ready. He said, well, I went in there and I washed my hands in the basin and I dried them on the towel. And he goes, and I saw two plates sitting on the table. So I sat down and my friend grabbed me and he said, wait, get up. Don't let mama catch you sitting at this table. This is for me and her. Your lunch is outside on the back porch. He says, well, I couldn't understand why I couldn't sit at the same table with my white friend. He said, so I sat down to eat and the dog came up trying to bite me and barking and yapping and everything. And I was trying to get the dog to get away from me. And my friend came to call the dog off and he said, Wade, the reason my dog is mad at you is because mama put your food in the dog's dish. And he says, well, I couldn't understand that. And I went home and I said to my daddy, I said, daddy, the white boy's mama made me eat after a dirty old dog out of the dog's dish. Why does she hate me so much for daddy? Now, is dad out of choice? Is dad going to say that's the way all white people are? I hate him, son. But his dad chose not to do that. His dad looked at him and he said, son, as you go through life, many people will hate you simply because of the way that you look. But don't hate him, son, because hatred is a sickness. And if a man hates you, you wouldn't want to hurt a sick person, would you? You want to help sick people get better. He said, so the thing is, pray for their soul. He goes, and reach out to them and show them love. That person probably never had love shown to them in their life. And that's where he made the choice. He said, right at that point, he said, I will never hate another man again. And, you know, that made sense to me. When that man died, I gave the eulogy at his funeral. But right before he died, he called me to his bedside. And he put his hand in my hand. And he had worked with Dr. King. And he said, Johnny, Dr. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream that one day black children and white children, Protestants and Catholics and Jews and Gentiles alike could all live in the same world together and truly be free at last. He said, don't let the dream die, Johnny. Keep the dream alive. And he squeezed my hand, and he went on, he went on and passed on. And I stood there at his funeral, and I gave the eulogy, and I made a promise, and that was back in 1998 when I spoke at that funeral, and I made a promise that I would do my best for whatever days I have left here on earth to keep that dream alive. I was head pallbearer at that funeral, and I went to shut the lid on that casket, and I looked at my friend laying there in that casket all dressed up to go away, but he had a look of peace and smile on his face. I patted him on the shoulder, and then I reached down, and I kissed him on the forehead before I shut the lid on that casket. I guess what I did there was I repaid a promise that I would made him years before because I told him whatever he did to that chicken, I was going to do to him. And it took a while, but I thank God for somebody like him who believed in a world where we could get along, where we could come together. And we might have differences, but we can, we can learn from those differences. And as I began to see these type of things, I, I began to, it, it began, made me a very happy person because now I can honestly say I have friends from every walk of life, every culture. I've traveled all over the, the world reaching out and trying to help people to make this a better world. When I came here to Sweden, and many years ago, I was walking through Stockholm, and there's a lot of publicity about me coming there, and I walked right up to a whole bunch of neo-Nazi skinheads. And they were standing there right there in the square, and this, this, this man up here was talking about uh, them wearing their Nordic crosses and all that stuff. They had all their Viking stuff on, and they had all that stuff, and their white power patches, and they were standing there, and they looked at me, and I looked at them, and I thought, hmm, about 40 of them and one of me, I think I better go this way, you know, and stuff like that. I'm not Chuck Norris, you know. But, uh, but anyway, you know, I, I headed the other way. But you know what? I realized that they, too, were mixed up, just like I was. But there's a better world waiting when we can stand and we can actually truly believe and hope. I also wanted to say this to you tonight before I close that um, um, I kind of have a kinship here with Sweden, and when I was over here, in the year of 2000, everywhere I said this, everyone laughed, okay? But I, I am a, a descendant. I come from the Clary family in uh, France, and, um, and uh, I'm a relative of Desiree, who married Jean Bernadotte and became king and queen of Sweden. 
And so whenever I said I was a descendant of Queen Desiree, I got laughed at everywhere I went. And I couldn't understand why everyone was laughing. And finally someone said, well, she wasn't the most liked queen. You know, said they was taught that she actually hated Sweden, but that wasn't true. She just didn't like the cold, and she used to complain all the time, you know, and things like that. But, you know, one thing about it is that I enjoy my culture. I enjoy my heritage. I enjoy being a southerner from Louisiana, where I live in Baton Rouge. I, I enjoy... I enjoy my southern food. I enjoy, you can tell that by looking at me, you know, and stuff. But, but I, I enjoy doing all kinds of things, you know. But the thing is, there's nothing wrong with loving your culture, loving your heritage, and enjoying that. But you've also got to love and respect other people's cultures and their heritage and realize they have a right to love theirs too. And let's all learn from each other. My gosh, if we didn't learn from each other, then we'd have to eat the same food all the time and people would hate that, you know. We got pizza from the Italians. We got Oriental food from the Orientals. And we got all kinds of stuff. And I don't know what Sweden's famous for, but I think chocolate, isn't it? I love chocolate, you know. <laughs> I guess, anyway, I don't know. But, uh, but the truth of the matter is, when we look at these things, let's remember this. A few years back, I was on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, and they bought the neo-Nazi skinheads on. And the skinheads was on the show, and they were saying that they were talking about the movie Schindler's List. And they were saying the Holocaust never happened. They said it never existed. Now, some people think that's far-fetched that someone would even say something like that. But the guy that used to be the head of the clan that I used to bodyguard, David Duke, is now a neo-Nazi. He almost became governor of Louisiana several years ago. And David Duke traveled in 2006 to Iran and met with Ahmadinejad at an anti-Holocaust conference, and they both shook hands and said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and together we will wipe Israel off the face of the earth. This is chilling when you hear a guy that's in charge of a whole country make a statement like that, and then teaming up with someone who was once with the Ku Klux Klan and saying that they want to kill the Jews. I am reminded, I am reminded of the anti-Semitism, and I am reminded of what happened at Auschwitz, Dachau, Buchenwald, Bergen-Belsen, all those type of things. And we're thinking, my gosh, can it happen again? Well, when I was on the Sally Jesse show, the neo-Nazi skinheads were on there, and they said the Holocaust never happened, and I challenged them. I said, if you say it never happened, come with me to the Simon Wiesenthal Holocaust Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, California. Take that tour of that place, and you come out of that place and tell me that it never happened. Sally Jesse Raphael said, if you will do what Johnny Clary says, I will pay for each and every one of you to go there. And they agreed. We all met there at the Holocaust Museum, and they went through there. They said it never happened. As we went through there, you go into the place, and it takes you the, through the plight of the Jews and all the things of the horrors of Auschwitz, the whole nine yards. When we came out, they put the microphones in front of their face, and they said, so do you say it never happened? They go, well, some of it happened, I guess. At that point... The guy that ran the museum said, see, this was not even worth the time. These people never change. I go, sir, that's where you're wrong. I said, before they went into this museum today, they said it never happened. And now they've come out and they've acknowledged that at least some of it happened. I said, I'm going to tell you at least that's a start. I said, I know that if I can change, other people can change. And so that's what it's all about. Let me leave you with this. George Santiana said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And Simon Burke says, evil prevails when good people do nothing. One of the most dignified things that you could do to show dignity is to take a stand and speak out against evil and do not let it go. A lot of people chose, choose to ignore it. Well, you know, you can go to the doctor and you can find cancer at the early stages and you can put a Band-Aid over it if you want and you can ignore it. But that doesn't mean it's going to go away. If you ignore it, soon it will become malignant and destroy the whole body. When it comes to racism, racism is a cancer on the human race. If you ignore it, it will not go away. It will destroy the human race. Do not ignore racism. Show dignity by taking a stand against it and realizing that there's hope for this world if we all work together to build a better world for change no matter what part of life we come from. Thank you so much for having me here in your country.